Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, and welcome to the Royal Society this evening. Thank you for coming uh, through the rain to get here. Um, it's very nice to see so many of you here. Um, the lecture this evening is being recorded, so uh, please turn off your mobile phones. Thank you. Uh, my name's Felicity Henderson, um, and I manage the History of Science events here at the Royal Society. Um, as some of you may know, we've had a gap in our program uh, while our library reading rooms were being refurbished earlier this year. Um, and so I'm very pleased to welcome you back this evening. This is a special year for the Royal Society uh, in which we've been celebrating our 350th anniversary. I'm sure you're well aware of that now. Um, and you can find out more about our wide-ranging program of events to celebrate that uh, on the website. As part of the anniversary celebrations, we've opened a new Centre for History of Science. Uh, and this is the first lecture to be run uh, by the new centre. It's therefore particularly appropriate to have Professor Michael Hunter here to speak to us this evening. Um, <laughs> this is not Professor. <laughs> this is not Professor Michael Hunter. <laughs> Um, Michael will need no introduction for many of you. He's the foremost historian of the early Royal Society, uh, having published groundbreaking books on the history of the Society as an institution, on its early membership, and on its place in the culture of early modern England. <coughs> he is focused particularly on the life and works of Robert Boyle, editing Boyle's works, his correspondence, and his notebooks or work diaries. Uh, Michael has also made sense of Boyle's huge archive, which is held here at the Royal Society. And this work has culminated recently uh, in Michael's biography, Boyle, Between God and Science, uh, which is a very readable account of a fascinating figure, very important figure in the early history of the society. Um, not content with this, Michael is now working on the visual culture of early modern Britain, um, and he is directing the British Printed Images to 1700 project, uh, which is an online database of prints and book illustrations, and it's a fantastic resource. You can go online and search it yourselves. But tonight, Michael's returning to the early days of the Royal Society uh, with his lecture, The Great Experiment, The Early Evolution of the Royal Society. So please welcome Professor Michael Hunter. Thank you very much. Um, you've already been reminded once this evening that this is the 300 this year is the 350th anniversary of the foundation of the royal society so it's appropriate that a variety of activities have been taking place celebrating this event including the congratulatory volume edited by bill bryson with contributions by various eminent scientists and others i want to focus on the society's earliest years there's no doubt of the momentousness of the society's foundation since it represented a completely new type of institution, a publicly constituted body, national in its remit, which was devoted to the pursuit and promotion of scientific research. In retrospect, the role that the society early came to play and the way in which it went about achieving this may seem almost self-evident as the archetype of the numerous comparable bodies that have followed in its footsteps ever since. But in fact, it could be argued that the process by which the society was set up and the way in which it developed in its early years was not as obvious as in retrospect as it is easily presumed. Since no such body had existed before, it was necessary for a process of experiment, even of trial and error, to occur before the mode of operation emerged which was to prove so effective. And it's that process that I intend to elucidate tonight on the basis of the truly remarkable documentation that survives concerning the society's early history, mostly in its own archive. Even the society's name may have surprised some of its early supporters. The somewhat establishmentarian title which it has borne ever since was first aired by John Evelyn in the dedication to a book published in 1661. But clearly this was not the name that many expected. 
In his notes on the society in the immediate aftermath of its foundation, virtuoso Elias Ashmole left a blank after rather than before the word society, evidently in the expectation that it would be called the Society of Philosophers or something like that. The result was that he had to go back and retrospectively insert royal above the line in his note. More striking is a further document associated with Evelyn, in this case a sheet of paper in his hand in which alternative coats of arms and mottos for the society are noted, in this case possibly dating from 1660. This shows that consideration was given to various alternatives to the blank shield quartered by the royal arms, which has been the society's insignia ever since. Instead, it might have had something more allegorical or mystical. One possibility was a sun in splendour with the motto, to the greater light. Another, a celestial globe juxtaposed with an all-seeing eye. Another, a hand holding a plumb line, possibly a Masonic symbol, while other designs had more directly scientific components, like a pair of cross telescopes. The same is also true of the epitaph, Nullius in Verba, which was adopted as the society's motto. As you'll be aware, this is a paraphrase of a passage in Horace's epistles affirming freedom from any master or school. The place of this might have been taken either by the Masonic-sounding formula that I've already quoted, or by omnia probate, try everything, quotation from Thessalonians 5.21, um, which actually also echoes John Evelyn's personal motto, omnia explorate meliora retinete. Or it might have had the quotation, et, augipus, aug, sorry, et augebita scientia, which is from the book of Daniel, chapter, chapter 12, verse 4. This is part of a slightly longer passage promising that many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased in the last ages of the world, and which had inspired much millenarian speculation earlier in the century, not least in the hands of Francis Bacon, whose vision for the collaborative pursuit of science itself formed part of the society's intellectual origins. On the other hand, the, the establishmentarian title and coat of arms that were selected are themselves redolent of a key element in the society's aspirations from its early, earliest years. And this was to an established corporate role, something which I stressed in my book, Establishing the New Science. This book was published in 1989, uh, 20 years ago. And in it, many of the themes that I'll be exploring this evening are more fully divulged. In the years preceding the Society's foundation in 1660, there had been a widespread revulsion against the instability that had reached a climax with the Civil War and an aspiration to more stable forms of organisation, which is to be found both among supporters of the parliamentary regime and its opponents. This is epitomised by the setting up of bureaucratic governmental bodies like the Council of Trade and Plantations or by initiatives like Samuel Hartlib's Office of Address, and these reflected a clear sense that organised bodies were to be preferred to less formal ones and that public and bureaucratic structures could achieve things which more personal initiatives could not. Linked to this was an ideal of permanence, also seen in the foundation in 1683, at almost the same time, of the Ashmolean Museum. Um, and I think it's not coincidental that the first public museum in this country dates from this period. This was similarly established as an integral part of the University of Oxford in order to ensure that it would withstand the mutability to which previous collections had been subject. It's revealing that in Ashmole's negotiations with the university over the foundation of the museum, reference was made to what might be done to protect his bequest in the event of civil wars or like calamities. The Royal Society was inspired by a similar wish to establish their institution to perpetuity. That's a quotation from an early, early statement by um, one of its fellows. To this end, the founders of the Society went to extraordinary lengths to set up an elaborate constitutional structure in its early years, which might almost seem top-heavy for an infant body of the kind that it represented. Having obtained a royal charter in 1662 which gave the society a status comparable to that of legally incorporated bodies like the chartered companies of the City of London. The, the, the fellows then, went, then secured a second charter in 1663, 
at a cost of £53, 7 shillings and 8 pence, in addition to the £35, 10 shillings spent on the first. So a lot of money was involved. The reason for this was that details of the society's constitutional structure were set out more clearly in the second charter than in the first, notably concerning the quora for decision-making and elections. There were also elaborate statutes which went into detail about how fellows and officers were to be elected and what the duty of, duties of the officers should be. It dealt, they dealt with how meetings should be held and how the work, society's work should be conducted, even how those who failed to work for the good of the society might, if necessary, be expelled. All of this was spelled out within two years of the society's foundation. Between them, these documents provided for a complex and highly sophisticated institution. The society was governed by a council of 21 elected annually, including a president, treasurer and two secretaries, all of whom swore an oath on appointment. Election was by secret ballot and required a formal proposal. Once elected, fellows were obliged to pay an admission fee and an annual subscription. The Charter also in, uh, entitled the Society to employ staff, to own property, to erect a college or colleges, to sue and be sued in the courts, and to appoint its own printer and license its own books. There was also elaborate provision for the records which the Society expected to keep, including a statute book containing all these documents, along with journal books, register books and letter books. These were evidently intended to be housed in a special chest which was brought to the society and which still survives, and which is the next slide. <laughs> there we are. There was clearly also an expectation that the society might expect an endowment to match its established status, which, in the words of a letter requesting such funds, would help to promote the public concerns of a society whose designs, if protected and assisted by authority, may so much conduce to the greatness and honour of their prince the real good of his dominions and the universal benefit of mankind. These grandiose ambitions are well encapsulated in the famous frontispiece to the official history of the body commissioned from the writer Thomas Spratt and published in 1667, in which the goddess fame crowns a bust of Charles II, who is flanked by the society's first president, William Viscount Brunker, and Francis Bacon in his robes as Lord Chancellor with the Society's coat of arms and motto prominently displayed above them. In addition, if you look carefully, you'll observe that to the left, in front of the bookcase, is the Society's diploma, or charter, and its statutes and journal book, along with the rather grand silver gilt mace that Charles II presented to the Society, and which is still in its possession. What's more, the Society's intellectual aspirations seem to have matched these overarching institutional ambitions, as is perhaps indicated on the Spratt frontispiece by the plethora of examples of scientific equipment in the background and of the books on related topics on the shelves to the left, whose titles can just be made out on their spines. What's remarkable about, about the expressions of its aims that came from the Society in its early years, including Spratt's history, is the breathtaking emphasis that they show on completeness, on comprehensiveness as a goal. In order to know what was already known and what still required investigation, the Society planned to scrutinise all books previously written on relevant topics as a means of collecting all the phenomena of nature hitherto observed and all philosophical experiments hitherto made and recorded. Such grandiose ambitions applied to technology as well as science in the society's hope to compile a full-scale history of trades in which industrial and technical processes would be surveyed and improved. Here is an illustration from an example of such an account of an industrial practice, in this case a description by Robert Hooke, the society's first curator of experiments, of the manner of making salt in a salt urn in Hampshire. In his history, Spratt explained how their purpose is, in short, to make faithful records of all the works of nature and art that can come within their reach. And this grandiloquence about the comprehensive scale of the Society's plans was repeatedly echoed. Thus, in his profuse correspondence promoting the Society and its aims, the first secretary, Henry Oldenburg, repeatedly gave voice to sentiments of a similar kind. It is our business in the first place, he wrote in 1663, to scrutinise the whole of nature and to investigate its activity and powers by means of observations and experiments. 
and then in course of time to hammer out a more solid philosophy and more ample amenities of civilization. He similarly explained in a letter to John Winthrop in Connecticut in 1667, Sir, you will please remember that we have taken to task the whole universe and that we were obliged to do so by the nature of our design. This is also seen in another of the society's aspirations in its early years to a museum of objects which would be complete. Robert Hooke wanted as full and complete a collection of all varieties of natural bodies as could be obtained, while Spratt described a general collection of all the effects of arts and the common or monstrous works of nature as one of the principal intentions of the society as soon as they were reduced into a fixed assembly. And I think that juxtaposition of institutionalisation and the ambition of completeness is significant in itself. He added that by the time he wrote, they had already drawn together into one room the greatest part of all the several kinds of things that are scattered throughout the universe. And from about this time, we begin to learn something of the kind of objects that the collection contained, as seen in this illustration of a horse-inch, Cocothraustes vulgaris, illustrated from the specimen in the Society's Museum in a book published in 1668. This went with the presumption that the society would actually test everything for itself. The collective testimony of the membership was seen as a key part of the process by which knowledge would be validated. Spratt emphasised how experimental findings were to be examined in the presence of the society as a corporate body, who observed all the chances and regularities of the proceeding, never giving it over till the whole company has been fully satisfied of the certainty and constancy, or on the other side of the absolute impossibility of the effect. In fact, it's clear that institutionalisation gave a strong impulse to the kind of inductive, accumulative view of science that had been championed a generation earlier by Francis Bacon, in contrast to the more deductive approaches of some of his contemporaries. And this is something which is also seen in other comparable bodies set up in these years, such as the Académie des Sciences in Paris, founded in 1666. In fact, in the case of the French Academy, which had a more exclusive membership than was the case with its relatively open English counterpart, it's interesting that when a choice was being made as to who should be allowed to join the new body, a conscious effort was made to avoid Cartesians who would make it into an empty talk shop. As it was, the French Academy, almost more than the English, made a virtue of collaborative experiment, which was even jointly published in volumes with titles like Memoirs to Serve for a Natural History of Animals and Plants by, by the members of the Royal Academy of Sciences. Here is one of the um, elaborate plates that appear in this official publication showing this corporate investigation in action, which I think gives a real sense of 17th century science in, in action. Sadly, we lack such visual records of the activity of the Royal Society in its early years. Returning to the Royal Society, I think that what was equally characteristic was the Society's proclivity to delegate specific responsibilities to committees, corporate subsets of the Society's overall institutional structure. Committees were set up from the outset to deal with matters like correspondence or the co compilation of inquiries to be sent throughout the known world to gather information. And when, in 1664, the Society began to find that it was asking too much for the whole of knowledge to be reformed at its weekly meetings, the reaction was to set up eight specialist committees dealing with different aspects of its work, from astronomy and optics to anatomy and chemistry, and from mechanical inventions to trade and agriculture. These committees had a fixed membership which was recorded in a scroll that no longer survives, to which alterations were recorded in the Society's minutes. Also, minutes were kept of the meetings of these committees. The, in this case, the um, committee responsible for perusing travel books in the search for useful information to further the society's goal of understanding nature. So those were the plans, but in practice, these grandiose ambitions proved more than the society could sustain. And what is particularly interesting about the Society's early history is the process by which the Society settled into a somewhat different set of roles to those initially envisaged, which nevertheless proved highly effective. The specialist committees soon fell by the wayside. Minutes survive like this only for a few months of their work. While the ambition to comprehensiveness was also abandoned. In the case of the Society's museum, some had from the outset 
laughed at it as too voluminous to have ducks, geese and hens, etc. Instead, the collection tended to specialise in the exotic, leaving the study of common objects to other contexts. And it was in this form that it was commemorated when a catalogue of it was published by Nehemiah Grew in 1681 as Museum Regalis Societatis. Here is the title page with the facing portrait of Daniel Colwell, who had been the society's chief benefactor in its early years, not least by buying up an entire cabinet of exotica formerly owned by a virtuoso, which continued to dominate the museum's content at the time of Grew's catalogue. The history of trades, in other words, the plan to study technology, proved similarly overambitious and achieved successes only in selected areas. For instance, concerning forestry, the subject of John Evelyn's famous silver, which initiated as a corporate initiative on the part of the society as part of the technological programme, with a committee, needless to say, devoted to it. But increasingly, Evelyn himself took responsibility for revising the various editions into which the book went. Even in terms of corporate experiment, a realisation is in evidence that a focus was needed if the society's activities were not to be so generalised as, as to be counterproductive. Hence, there were repeated attempts to introduce a more systematic approach to the society's work, initially seen in the programme for a series of experiments on pneumatics produced by Robert Hooke when he was point, appointed the society's first curator of experiments in November 1662 and echoed in comparable initiatives at intervals over the society's early years. For instance, on the 4th of December 1666, there was a discussion as to how the experiments of the public meetings of the society might be best carried on, whether by a continuous series of experiments taking in collateral ones as they were offered, or by going on in that promiscuous way which had hitherto obtained. And then again in 1679, it was decided to prosecute a single subject at a time as the main work of the society's meetings. There was also a marked change in the nature of the society's activity in its early years in the form of a decline of the amount of actual experimentation that was carried out at the society's meetings and a rise in the extent to which meetings were taken up by reports and discussions of research done elsewhere. A key function for the society, but one which seems to have occupied a rather secondary position in the priorities of the society's founders who anticipated a frenetic programme of experimentation in its own right. Whereas in 1664, reportage and the reading of correspondence each occupied a place in the society's business about equivalent to that of actual experiments. By 1680, six times as much time was taken to listening to results as to generating them. So there was a complete shift in the balance between the two. This is a statistic that I derived from some important quantitative work on the Society's Minutes, as recorded in its journal book, carried out many years ago by the American scholar Robert G. Frank, Jr. This trend was bewailed by the Society's organisers, who often sought to reverse it. But it could be argued that it was precisely in this area that the Society could be most effective, not so much in actually doing science as in arbitrating it. In other words, the society acquired a key significance as a forum where research done or observations made elsewhere were reported, discussed and evaluated, thus meaning that corporate appraisal remained crucial, but at one remove from the actual process of scientific discovery. Indeed, although this role had only been peripherally foreseen by the society's founders when they initially set up the institution, this was one of the functions for which it was best equipped. It's almost as if the men who founded the society had been right to see the value of a corporate structure, but had to learn what functions it could most effectively serve. And this role was not limited to scientists in this country, but instead gave the society a truly international status. From an early stage, the society was called on to assess and adjudicate scientific findings from all over Europe, as with the conflicting observations of the course of the Comet of 1665 made by Johann Hevelius in Danzig and Adrian Ozo in Paris. And later, the society was to accredit and promote the research of such scientists as Antony van Leeuwenhoek from Holland and Marcello Malpigi from Italy. Van Leeuwenhoek used the society to publish virtually all his microscopic findings. And the result is that the Society's archive is the chief repository of the delicate drawings of his microscopical observations that he compiled, 
this slide shows magnified cross-sections of an oak stem, which was sent to the Society in 1675. This role was equally important for lesser men, as with one French savant who explained to Henry Oldenburg in a letter dated 1668, if I should be so happy as to deserve your approval, I should thereby expect to obtain that of all the citizens of the Republic of Letters. Since in order to judge physical works properly, one must be of your opinion and of that represented by that illustrious and celebrated Royal Society, which is known to all learned men as the first of those which have been created in imitation of it. Associated with this was an equally significant process of accreditation and demarcation. The society had a key role in deciding who to take seriously and who to ignore. Some of those who contacted the society were quietly discouraged, such as the German savant Eckhard Leichner, who wrote in about his apodictical method for solving all the problems of religion and philosophy, and who was quietly but firmly informed that this was not the kind of thing the society went in for. The society was also in a position to define the norms of scientific communication, emphasising the value of sober reportage and restraint from speculation, while at the same time showing a receptiveness to novel hypotheses, if properly founded. Here we encounter the stress on matters of fact, on which emphasis has been laid by certain recent historians. In fact, it's even been claimed that Isaac Newton adapted his findings concerning light when he reported them to the, to the society in the early 1670s in order to give the impression that they derived from discrete experiments of which he gave a circumstantial report, which in fact misrepresented the actual process by which he had arrived at his findings. Related to this was the question of what subjects were considered within the society's remit, which again had a crucial, if hardly foreseen, function in defining the boundaries of what constituted science as a discipline, centering on natural and mechanical problems, but extending through the life sciences towards medicine and through chemistry and applied mathematics towards, te towards technology. Interestingly, one corollary was to exclude subjects like magic, which, though of great interest to some fellows, were frowned on by others. As a result, the society simply ignored occult-tinged pursuits, thus helping to demarcate the boundaries of science in a crucial, if negative, manner, which had a major, if unplanned, impact in the following years. Here, too, the society more or less consciously discovered roles which had not really been foreseen when it was constituted, yet, yet which were to prove highly significant. The society also had to learn how best to achieve its goals within such resources as were it, as it, at its disposal. And here again, a rather brutal process of education had to occur as the institution's early hopes of lavish endowment were disillusioned and it found itself subsisting on the modest income provided by the subscriptions of its fellows, each of whom was obliged to pay 52 shillings a year. One casualty was the idea of the society having its own purpose-built premises, a project which nearly met materialised in 1667 to 8, when the society sought contributions for a college or research institute on the bank of the Thames. These contributions were itemised in a lavish vellum-bound volume which still survives in the society's archive and which I reproduce here. In the event, the contributions proved disappointing, meaning that the plan was abandoned and London was never graced by the purpose-built Baroque scientific edifice that had been planned, possibly to a design by Wren. Even the scale of the society's activities was subject to such constraints since the institution could only ever afford a handful of paid employees on its modest income. Yet these proved crucial, notably the first secretary, Henry Oldenburg, and the first curator of experiments, Robert Hooke. Arguably, these two men did more to define the corporate ethos of the society than anyone else. Hooke in terms of the society's experimental programme and Oldenburg in terms of its public role as refer reflected first in his profuse correspondence and then in the printed spin-off than that, which he inaugurated in 1665 in the form of philosophical transactions. Once invented, the transactions quickly came to fulfil a role that, barely previously, previously barely noticed, came to be recognised as crucial, namely as a convenient register for the bringing in and preserving many experiments which, not enough for a book, would else be lost. In other words, a further means of recording and validating scientific research and stimulating cognate investigations for which the society could take responsibility. 
Oldenburg was thus responsible for the chief agencies by which the processes of arbitration and accreditation to which I've just referred were actually implemented. Yet typically, the society had initially presumed that correspondence would best be dealt with by yet another committee. And it was only in practice that it discovered that this function was much more effectively carried out by the hard work of a dedicated individual in the form of Oldenburg, thus providing a further instance of the society's early process of education, which I've been illustrating throughout the talk. Indeed, Oldenburg handled more than 300 incoming and outcoming letters a year, as well as editing philosophical transactions and keeping the society's minutes. And his epistolary activity is um, celebrated by the massive edition of his correspondence by the late A.R. and M.B. Hall, and he deserves perhaps more credit um, than has sometimes been the case for the key role that he played in the society's early evolution. But I think it's important to stress that Oldenburg's success depended on the symbiosis that existed between his remarkable personal activity and the corporate role of the society. Oldenburg was at pains to explain to his correspondents how he had read their letters out at meetings of the society, and the arbitration that then occurred was a corporate step taken by the fellows as a body of which Oldenburg was a mere reporter. For all the significance of individuals like Oldenburg, this was only effective in conjunction with the corporate activity of the society as a body, which transcended the role of individuals even while taking advantage of it to achieve the society's goals. Indeed, another key facet of the society in its early years was its voluntary nature. The way it was made up of quite a large and diffuse membership, in contrast to the carder of paid scientists who made up the French Academy. It was really the archetype of the voluntary institution. And this is illustrated both by this early manuscript list of the society's membership, interestingly divided up by social rank, or by this example of the more familiar printed list that was circulated every year in the society's early years, partly as a ballot paper for the annual elections of officers and council, but also as a means of propagating knowledge of the society and its distinguished makeup. In fact, due to the profuse survival of the society's records, we know a great deal about its fellows in its early years, to the extent of knowing who paid their subscriptions or spoke at meetings or otherwise helped to support the society's corporate endeavours, as also who lost interest soon after joining and had to be expelled in purges of the membership in which the society indulged from time to time. What's apparent from analysing the records that record the, 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 this is that the society was sustained by a core of between 30 and 50 committed supporters who stuck to the society through thick and thin it, 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 during its early decades, often serving as council members or officers, and many of them showing a striking longevity, so that some of those who had joined the society in its very earliest years were still active in 1700. A number of these were figures who are well known retrospectively for their scientific or other credentials, such as Robert Hooke or John Evelyn. But others were less, known, well, less well known figures, like Sir John Hoskins or Abraham Hill. What is striking is that this cadre seems to have formed an ambitious, knowledgeable, and effective team with a significance as a group which transcends the significance of its individual membership and which can be seen as responsible for all of the society's crucial corporate initiatives in its earliest, early years. Obviously, its members were not unanimous in their views. In fact, another facet of the rich documentation associated with the society in its early years is that we can actually eavesdrop, eavesdrop on some of the debates that took place as to how the society's goals were best achieved, particularly in relation to efforts to improve the society's efficiency and to reform its workings that took place in the late 1660s and 1670s. Thus, not all were convinced that the purpose-built premises planned in 1667 to 8 was as good an idea as its protagonists asserted. A among those who expressed such reservations was the canny John Wallace, professor of geometry at Oxford, who commented in a letter to Oldenburg as follows. I wish your building good success, but cannot promise that I shall be able to get you subscriptions to it here at Oxford. 
nor do I presume to deliver my opinion of the design, knowing so little about it, but take for granted so many wise men see very good reason to undertake it and ways how to get it perfected. In other words, he delivered a fairly decisive vote of no confidence. And equally revealing was the comment of another fellow, Samuel Pepys, who, although subscribing himself, noted how several I saw hang off, and I doubt it will spoil the society, for it breeds faction and ill will and becomes burdensome to some that cannot or would not do it. Divergent views also became apparent in the debates as to how the society's goals might, might best be achieved in the early 1670s, from which some extraordinary records survive, including discussion papers by leading fellows, notably one by a fellow who annoyingly identified himself only as A.B., but who showed a very shrewd grasp of the society's shortcomings and its goals, and who showed particular concern about the society's public image or reputation and how this might be improved. From this period, we even have evaluative lists of the society's members compiled for the benefit of those trying to plan the institution's future, in which those fellows who were deemed indispensable were separated out from those who were not, thus complementing the evidence from the accounts and the minutes as to their contribution to the society. Documents like these are revealing in themselves, but it's also interesting that on the whole, such discussions seem to have tended to strengthen the society rather than to weaken it to enhance its resolve effectively to pursue the goals for which it had been founded in the first place. In fact, this corporate identity and vigour meant that the society had a striking resilience when its, la when its lack of state support placed it in a vulnerable position, as was the case more than once in its early decades. Contrary to the view of some who have adopted a kind of great man theory of institutional history, the society was not saved from these crises by the intervention of the likes of Sir Christopher Wren or Sir Isaac Newton. If anything, some of the over-decisive individual initiatives in which Newton indulged during his presidency may have done more harm than good. Instead, the institutional structure that the founders inaugurated had real staying power just as they intent had intended. They may have been naive in some of their initial hopes and plans and may have had to learn by experience the functions that such an institution could most usefully serve. But that doesn't reduce our debt to them for their prescience in seeing the need for such a body and for giving it the overall institutional shape that has proved so resilient ever since. Thank you.